Welcome to another video in the OSCE series. So in this video, we'll be talking about the most common benign neonatal skin conditions, their etiology and management. So the first one is called as erythema toxicum. It's the most common postular skin lesion. It's characterized by erythematous macules and papules, which can evolve into pustules. And classically, there is erythema at the base of these skin lesions. So that's why it's got in the name of flea beaten appearance, like for example, this. Usually, these lesions appear within the first week of life. However, they can be seen up to the first four to six weeks of life. The face, trunk and extremities are commonly involved. Classically, the palms and soles are spared. So this is important to remember because in a few differentials of pustular skin lesions in newborns, the palms and soles are classically involved. But here, they are spared. Uh, it is a clinical diagnosis, so no investigation is required. However, if uh, a smear of these pustules is sent for investigation, it will show eosinophilia. Okay, so an easy way of remembering it is erythema toxicum E, you will have eosinophilia. Again, no treatment is required. However, it's very important to counsel the parents that these are benign skin lesions and there's no need to apply any powder, lotion, cream, etc. Because the neonatal skin is very uh, delicate and you don't want to create harm. So, having said that, there are other infectious causes of pustules in a newborn. So, it could be either bacterial, fungal, viral or spirochetal. All of these uh, causes along with pustules have associated findings. Like you will have signs of sepsis, the child will be sick looking. There'll be high WBC count, positive blood culture, like in case of a bacterial infection. Or like, for example, in syphilis, the lesions classically involve the palms and soles. So it's important to keep these differentials in mind that a postular lesions in a newborn could either be infectious. However, if the child is uh, normal looking, there's no other sign of infection, it's more likely uh, because of erythema toxicum. Now, the second common Skin lesion is called the transient neonatal pustular melanosis. This is a vesicular pustular rash which classically lacks erythema, unlike what we saw in erythema toxicum. Now, these lesions rupture easily and they leave behind scales and pigmentation, which usually disappear by about three to four weeks of life. All areas of the body can be affected, involving even the palms and soles. Now, again, this is a clinical diagnosis, but however, if you send the pustule for staining, it will show neutrophils. So an important way or an easy way of remembering it is runs in neonatal N, neutrophils N. Okay. So again, this is a clinical diagnosis like we saw and no treatment is required. Just counsel and reassure the parents. The third one is called acne neonatorum. So it is seen as uh, many as in 20% of newborns. These are basically closed comedones over the forehead, cheek, nose and basically involving the face. They happen because of stimulation of the sebaceous glands from the maternal and infant androgens. Again, they resolve spontaneously without scarring over time. However, if these lesions are extensive or if they persist for longer, then they can be treated by applying 2.5% benzoyl peroxide lotion locally over these skin lesions. The fourth one is called melia. So these are tiny, pearly white or yellow papules that we can see here around the nose. Now, basically, they are retention of keratin within the dermis. They commonly involve the face. Again, the forehead, nose and cheek chain are even more common on the face. And again, they spontaneously disappear within the first month of life. Nothing needs to be done. Seborrheic dermatitis, so these are again very commonly seen and often uh, a reason for concern in parents. So you can either have erythematous or greasy scales. Now the erythematous lesions predominate over the flexural uh, folds and in the intertrigenous areas. So you will have it over the nape of the neck, over the elbows, etc. So that is where you will see the erythematous lesions, whereas the scaling and those greasy lesions are more common over the scalp, so what is commonly called as a cradle cap. Now, the seborrheic dermatitis is because of a yeast infection called Malsigia furfur. Again, this is spontaneously resolving. So, again, reassurance of parents is the most important thing that you need to do. However, if the lesions are extensive or again, if they persist for longer or they're causing discomfort or for cosmetological purposes, they can be treated by applying moisturizers, petroleum jelly, or the last resort would be applying ketoconazole or 
a low dose steroid locally on these skin lesions. Next, again, most interesting and commonly seen skin lesion is the Mongolian spot, also called as dermal melanosis. So these are bluish green to black colored oval or irregular in shape skin lesions, most commonly over the lumbosacral region. Now, the Asian and African ethnic background individuals are more commonly seen to have these Mongolian spots. And where does the name come from? So interestingly, the name is, uh, the, the term was coined in by the German anthropologist who named it after the Mongolians because he thought that this is the race or this is the only race where you see Mongolian spots. However, that's not the case. But because this, this terminology was coined in years back, it's still been the same. Why do you see these Mongolian spots? So these are basically arrested migration of melanocytes from the neural crest to the skin. They are present at birth, most common or most prominently seen about one year of age and then start regressing and almost all of them disappear by about puberty. However, it's important to remember that certain characteristics of these Mongolian spots, like if they are really big, that is more than 10 centimeters, if they have extra sacral locations or located over the anterior trunk, if you have multiple Mongolian spots, more generalized distribution, if the spots increase in number after the first few months of life, or if they have indistinct feathery borders, these Mongolian spots warrant investigation because it has been found that certain spots, certain Mongolian spots have associations with inborn erythema metabolism like gangliosidosis, mucopolysaccharidosis, or neven pick. Now, a common differential of Mongolian spot is bruising. However, how do you differentiate the two? So, Mongolian spot will be non-tender. They do not change in color and it may take up to several months to disappear. Whereas if you have a bruise, let's say in a case of a battered baby or there's some kind of trauma, those lesions will be tender and there'll be a change in the color as and when the hemolysis and the blood collection happens. And usually they disappear within the first or within a few weeks of life. However, like Mongolian spots may persist for a few months, even up to a few years. So that is a common differential of a Mongolian spot, which is a bruise and needs to be differentiated for medical legal purpose. Next is called as cutis marmorata. So you have a reticulated, mortal-like, net-appearing skin. Okay, why do you see that? It's, it's basically because of dilatation of capillaries and venules with response to cold, which signifies an underlying immature autonomic nervous system, which is very common in newborns. So another common uh, manifestation of the immature autonomic nervous system is your uh, acrocyanosis, which is cyanosis of the limbs. That, that's again because of the same reason. And both of these lesions disappear within the first few weeks of life as the newborn matures. So they disappear with warming and with time. However, if you have these lesions appearing beyond one month of age, it could be a marker for associated syndrome, syndromes or even hypothyroidism, and it might warrant investigation. Next is what we call as stalk bite, or in this case, neven fl nevus flamens nuke, nuke because it's located over the nape of the neck. So these are cluster of pink or reddish purple blood vessels or capillaries, usually located uh, on, the, uh, on the neck and at the back of the head. Again, these are uh, benign lesions. They resolve with time. Nothing needs to be done. Now, a common differential of these uh, pink colored skin lesions is what is called as the port wine stain. So it's important to remember that these are permanent birthmarks. All the other skin lesions that we saw till now will eventually resolve with time, whereas port wine stain is a permanent birthmark. It's again characterized by like a smooth, flat, pink, purple, or reddish skin lesion, uh, particularly involving the face, but can again involve other parts of the body. Where does it get its name from? So it's like as if someone has spilled dark uh, red wine over the face, and that's why it's got its name of port wine stain. Again, this is an abnormal uh, collection of capillaries. Usually, port wine stains are harmless, but they might have association with Sturge Weber or Kreppel Trenoni syndrome. Sturge Weber, along with the port wine stain over the face, can have abnormal collection of capillaries in the brain, which can lead to neurological complications, and they also have associated glaucoma. So, all of these needs to be investigated. So, these were the common. Uh, benign neonatal skin lesions, although there are few more, but these are what we encounter more commonly in clinical practice. So at the end of the video, you should be able to enumerate uh, 
the common neonatal skin conditions which can be asked to you in your viva. If your newborn case has any of these lesions, you should be able to identify them and answer those relevant questions. And most important from clinical practice is to be able to know that these lesions are benign in nature. They're not pathological. They, they will eventually resolve with time. And reassurance and counseling of the parents is the most important step that we need to learn. So hope you like the video. Thank you for watching it. Thanks.